corporations, politicians, and the power elite, increasingly out of touch with the lives of ordinary citizens, have built an elaborate and sophisticated industry to measure the feelings, prejudices, and sentiments of the public. This constant effort to take the pulse of the public, embodied in mechanisms such as focus groups, gives us the illusion that what we think and feel matters. But the focus group is not a tool for democratization. It is a tool that permits the elites to consolidate ever more power and ever more profit at our expense by orchestrating prearranged occurrences that are packaged to look and sound like the expression of popular will and desire. Rather than respond to popular will, the propaganda industry shapes and molds the attitudes of the population by skillfully manipulating our thoughts and desires. I am joined in the studio by Liza Featherstone, the author of Divining Desire, Focus Groups and the Culture of Consultation. She looks in her book at the creation of the advertising and public relations industry and how it is used to saturate our culture with lies and manufactured emotions that, in essence, get us to call for our own enslavement. So in your book, Divining Desire, uh, you look at the creation of focus groups, which I didn't know, which is kind of fascinating, actually came out of the left, yeah. came out of Vienna. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about the genesis of those groups and how they were rapidly <laughs> seized upon by the corporate world. Sure. I mean, focus groups um, do evolve um, out of out of the left, out of the, um, the the impulse to find out what people want, what to find out what um, what what might work, make um, democracy work better. Um, they um, they come out of um, a lot of experimentation with qualitative research. Um, during um, Red Vienna, Vienna um, Vienna's experiment with municipal socialism in the 1920s, um, the um, the Viennese socialists um, were um, a very inspiring group in a lot of ways. But they were also a cultural and um, upper middle class elite. They were very out of touch with um, ordinary Viennese, so they had a lot of ideas about um, what how to create the kind of person that would really thrive under democratic socialism. And um, and some of their ideas, um, they thought people should listen to opera instead of well, soap but, but operas. But they do the focus groups and find out everybody wanted to listen to light, popular music. Stuff exactly. Like this, right? they, they found out people liked people liked you know um, cheesy pop right. music and people liked um, liked soap operas. You know, so so the, uh, the, the they were uh, as as um, w um, Paul Lazarsfeld, um, when one of their number would say later, we were trying to understand why our propaganda was unsuccessful. Right, right. right. <laughs> so know? a lot of these people, many of whom are Jewish, mm. uh, come to the United States. Exactly. Mm. And if they're working in sociology departments, mm. uh, doing this kind of research, uh, they're not making any money. Mm -hmm. So they go to places like Columbia mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and C. Wright Mills, the, the great sociologist, the power yeah. elite, of course, is very critical. They, they very quickly, including these leftists, yeah. self-identified, sell out. Explain what happened. Well, at first, um, they're doing this kind of research um, mostly for government contracts. So, um, in the under and explain, you know, I suppose we should just explain briefly what a focus group is, sure, and 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 how they were fulfilling these contracts. Sure. So, um, so a, a focus group is um, a small group um, of um, a, a small group of people. Now it's usually about eight to twelve people. Um, in um, and the um, the premise is that um, that insight will be derived through the discussion of the group. So rather so rather than um, a survey where you ask a lot of individuals a question, um, the um, the focus group is going to have a discussion. And the premise and the and the what you're driving at is why do people th um, think the things they do? Why so do they're they bringing they in uh, mm -hmm. you know well trained. Mm -hmm. Psychoanalysts, psychologists, sociologists, right. studying the way facial they're, because they're on a mm -hmm. two-way mirror where they can see in, they can't see out. They Eventually, study facial yes. expressions yep. of, uh, later, yep. and what you know emotions are triggered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Madison Avenue, mm -hmm. right? 
So at first they're um, they're doing this for um, for the Roosevelt administration, whose intentions are somewhat similar to the Red Viennese. They've got um, they they they, um, they want people to um, um, they want to be able to make some kind of social democracy work better, and they're an elite who are very out of touch, and you know so they they need to learn more about, for instance, how to get people to want to go fight the Nazis and make those sacrifices um, by not the, making them as scary as they thought. Yes, people, by not they making them the so Nazis. scary, people said, you know what, we don't, yeah, right. Exactly. Well, that campaign had to end. Right? It, it, it was helpful <laughs> if you make them too scary. Right. People are like, no, right. thanks. <laughs> you know, we were just rather. Stay home. Um, exactly. That's exactly what they found. Um, and um, but then you know after World War II, there's um, um, the, the the needs of the elites change, right? So um, so, so um, they need people to um, begin consuming more. Um, you know the um, the economy is no longer. Um, propped up by the wartime industries, um, the, um, and and people have been sacrificing all these years. Uh, although, uh, you know. although this was something that Laswell and Bernays had begun in the twenties, absolutely. Right? I mean, absolutely. it wasn't new. Absolutely, people had the idea of getting people to have desires, have more mass consumption was not new, but um, but there it was um, it was ramped up um, to um, Did it become to a new would it be degree. fair to say that it was more scientific then? More different kinds of scientific expertise were bought, brought to bear on the topic. So Madison Avenue starts bringing in all these PhDs, and it's very conscious. You know, I read memos, uh, in, internal memos from the J. Walter Thompson right. ad agency, you have those in the um, where they, you know, they're they're saying we need we need all different kinds of academic PhDs to um, to, to to come in and um, and 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 help us figure out how to sell things to people. So um, so so in this context, um, you know the. Um, um, all, so all of these um, all of these um, European scholars who have all this um, uh, have all this knowledge um, are um, and and have been um, honing their qualitative research craft um, in in the context of um, of the Roosevelt administration's wartime needs um, now um, go into Madison Avenue and um, and and many of them um, get um, um, make a lot more money. Doing, some of them become um, quite wealthy. Some of them become quite wealthy um, doing market research, um, and um, and and bringing to bear um, sort of questions of uh, of um, psychoanalytic questions. You know, so um, Ernest Dichter famously um, reasons that uh, is a, a, another Viennese um, with psychoanalytic uh, leanings. But it's um, just all proof how fast the left will sell out. Yes, you, when you pay them enough. <laughs> that's that, 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 that's that's very true, but it's also but it also shows how um, a, a lot of times these things are structural rather than individual. Like individuals can have you know these um, certain kinds of principles and intentions, um, but um, but um, the drift of society is to have you fulfill um, certain roles with whatever expertise you have, and um, and and you're and and you're very often just going to end up doing that. Um, so, um, so so he so Ernest Dichter um, famously reasons that um, um, that that to sell cars you need to think of 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 the car as as the mistress rather than the wife, um, you know, and you know, appeal to the uh, appeal to, um, um, to 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 men's sort of adventurous sexual nature, and um, and, and all of this becomes. Um, um, both um, both both scientific um, and also um, gives consumer culture a certain um, you know um, eros and frizz on to it. You're very uh, aware of how destructive this is to democracy itself. Mm -hmm. You talk about the creation, or I guess this is Elizabeth Cohen's phrase, uh, the creation of a consumer's republic. Uh, there's a phrase, I can't remember who coined it, participatory fascism, mm -hmm. where we're allowed to participate on uh, consumer items or what is largely irrelevant while power is taken from us. Exactly. And this is also a theme that you hit persistently right. in the book. Yeah. So you know, this is really, I mean, it, it is amazing 
um, how much um, this, um, this history shows um, that um, we, the people, have just been consulted so intensely about um, so many particulars that are basically trivial. Like what you know, what what kind of what kind of toothpaste we're going to um, have on the market? What um, what is going to how are uh, how is some popular movie going to end? Uh, you know, and well, you, uh, you, and know. you said in the book they'll they'll actually have different endings, of course, and yes. then test them out. Then the focus group will weigh in on which is the which is the better one, and um, and so, so we're so consulted, um, and yet. Um, um, as this is going on, as we're um, as they're developing more and more mechanisms to consult us about these kinds of things, um, meanwhile, ordinary people um, are, have less and less power over things that really matter. So you also write that this uh, fuels the divide between the elites, the mm -hmm. oligarchic elites, and the the rest of the country. They they become increasingly clueless mm -hmm. That's as right. to what. Uh, you know, people like you and I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there is more of a need. Although right. they have, as you point out in the book, great disdain that they even have to go and ask. Yeah, they hate this. Right. It, it becomes necessary, as you write, not only to sell us products we don't need, but in the political realm, politics we don't want that are starkly at odds with our material interests, and then you write, listening is not the same as sharing power. So right. uh, this becomes an effective mechanism uh, to get us to buy products, because, mm -hmm. of course, it's, it's not appealing to reason, but to emotion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I think at one point you talk about, um, was it a bread mix or something, and uh, they just felt, you know, people who were cooking felt uh, guilty, and so they said, well, we need to put an egg in. That's right. That's right. And, that became... and women would feel they were do so doing something and you know, not so guilty about not giving their families the cake from scratch. I mean, it's interesting that little things like that can make a product take off. That's right. That's right. No, and, the, and the, those kinds of things are fascinating. And then, you know, you, you, know, you realize, that, you know, you're just, um, you, you're, just, you're just the same way. You have, the, you have all these little... Um, unconscious reactions um, to things that will make you buy or not buy something, but yes, exactly. They are these these methods are ultimately um, used to sell us um, policies and politics that are really not in our interests. So we have we we have in um, um, by the um, 1990s um, we have um, Frank Luntz, the Republican pollster. Um, using um, using these kinds of uh, focus groups to um, come up with phrases like the death tax. Right. We'll, where, go, we'll you, go back to that. Yeah. We'll talk you, about the master of this, Bill right. Clinton. Right. Uh, even outdoing Ronald Reagan yes. when we come back. That's right. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about the corrosive power of advertising and public relations with Lisa Featherstone. <laughs> Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about manufacturing culture, or consent, as Walter Lippmann once said, with Liza Featherstone. So before the break, uh, we raised the issue of how this ability to study uh, popular desire, manipulate popular desire, migrated into the political realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, um, what what happens is um, in um, in the 1980s, you know, just as we saw, um, just as we saw so many um, researchers move from academia into Madison Avenue in the 50s, um, in the 1980s, um, there, um, there the um, field of political consulting starts to really take off, and in that context, we see a lot of um, focus group experts um, migrate from Madison Avenue um, into the field of political consulting, um, on the premise that um, that that the um, the challenges are just the same. That you are basically selling 
um, something to, to people um, that they possibly don't want. Don't need, <laughs> you or, know, want. Don't need or want. It's called neoliberalism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. and, and, it, and exactly, and it becomes much more um, relevant at this time because the um, because the divide we spoke of between the elites and the masses has only grown. Right. So the interests are, are really sharply at odds. And, uh, and so, so the need to sell people policies that they um, may not want or need um, is, is, is all the more Well, you pressing. talk about Dukakis, the mm -hmm. famous Willie Horton ad, Willie Horton being mm -hmm. uh, a prisoner who's given a weekend furlough, commits rape and murder, mm -hmm. uh, and they run focus groups and find, uh, Dukakis is ahead in the polls. That's right, mm, that's right. Against the first Bush. And this, you know, they find an emotional reaction. Right. And they just exploit it that, across the country. That's right, and they show these scary pictures of um, of Willie Horton and, you know, and, and re repeat the horrible things that he did. Um, and and, and it, and it takes down Dukakis. It does. Um, it, it's, I mean, there may, it, Dukakis may have helped take down Dukakis, but yes. it certainly yes. it was an important element. That's right. That's right. Um, it, you know, in it, um, there, it's actually since been contested whether that was um, really the nail in in the coffin for the Dukakis campaign. But what was even more important was that. Um, it showed political consultants and political people that um, these focus groups um, and um, and the insights that they yielded could be really fruitful. And, and, mm -hmm. and George Herbert Walker Bush didn't actually like them. He hated, uh, he hated them. Uh, I, I didn't think he had any integrity, so mm -hmm. I guess he has a little. Either that or he's obtuse. Um, uh, and so Reagan comes in and very astutely focus groups are used mm -hmm. uh, in his candidacy. Because there is an understanding that the policies Reagan is promoting are very unpopular. Exactly. But if they can create images and get Reagan to loop back the language that they're hearing in the focus group, um, he can create impressions. Right. Uh, emotional impressions. Right. On the public that divert attention from policies that actually don't have much support. Exactly. So on the policy level, he's he's breaking the air traffic controllers union. He's he's doing things that are just going to be decimating to the living standards of Americans. Um, and um, but but on the um, on the product level, Reagan's a great product. Well, he had lots. He's of He's really appealing. <laughs> he's an actor. <laughs> well, you know? didn't he work for GE? Was he? Yeah. Didn't he sell tobacco? I think. Or I mean, he, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. He's, he's and, he was well trained. And he's also selling American optimism, which right, is right. always a, a, a welcome product. You know, so so he's a, so, so he's he's really a natural for this kind of. Um, of, of marketing and um, and and they um, and they're able to do a lot with him. Um, yeah, the the first George Bush is is as you, as you suggest was very um, very suspicious of these things. Even though he's now become kind of um, the example, his his Willie Horton campaign is the example of of such a successful use of focus groups. He generally um, he, he generally um, denigrated it. He would say, "I don't want to. I don't want to do that. I just want to, you know. Um, I, I, I just want to trust my own instincts." Um, Which didn't get him reelected. It didn't. Yeah, um, I just want to throw in there because it's in the book um, that in the focus groups they found that people were really distrustful of the elites. Right. Which of course he comes out of the, exactly. both the financial mm -hmm. and political elite, and so they had to find a mechanism by which they could overcome this distrust. Exactly. And the way they did it was by demonizing a black man. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Across the country. Exactly. Yeah, people didn't like this guy. They, this this guy Bush one, they felt he was out of touch. He didn't he, he didn't understand how the grocery scanner worked, right, you know, right. revealing that he, he didn't right, go to right, the grocery right. store. You know, he had a lot of issues. Um, but, 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 but the focus groups found that an emotional terror, on an emotional level, terror of a black criminal could override that. So we, we move on to Bill Clinton. Yes. Uh, who became, although he didn't have Reagan's uh, acting pedigree, uh, a master yeah. at this deep disingenuousness. One of the things that they find out, I believe it was in the Reagan campaign, 
when they're doing focus groups is that you have uh, a white underclass in economic freefall. That's right. And they blame black people. That's right. And Clinton right. seized on that. That's right. That's absolutely right. So Clinton really um, um, built on um, the insights um, the, of the Republican focus groups on that, and um, and you know, and crusaded on um, ending welfare as we know it, which to many white people was code for stop giving money to black people. Even though that was, you know, of course there were more white welfare recipients than black, but the stereotypes function in that way, um, and. Um, and you know a lot of rhetoric against crime, which again was code to many white people um, for um, we were cracking down on black people, um, and um, and and he was really um, and um, and and meanwhile you know he's he's pursuing um, labor and trade policies that are just the same um, as, um, as as the as the Republican and, agenda and he, that are not throughout his presidency. Mm -hmm. He he uh, from your book. He almost wouldn't make a public statement unless he'd run it through a focus group, and I can't find the passage. But uh, you write at one point, or you quote someone, that he was a master at essentially uh, ingesting and then repeating uh, it, it with exactly the same phrases. Yes, there's a wonderful um, bit of praise of Clinton from um, Republican pollster Frank Luntz, who um, who was um, him, himself. Oh, I found it. The words he uses come right out of Stan Greenberg's focus groups. Greenberg literally pulls the words out of the mouths of ordinary Americans and put the, puts them in the mouths of the president. The result is Bill Clinton speaks like real Americans speak. Exactly. And that is the core of Bill Clinton, of the Clintons. Exactly. And that's why, you know, and I think we've all experienced this listening to Bill Clinton speak, um, you know, that, um, that, that occasionally you... Even if you really dislike the guy politically, as I always did, you hear him speak and you're like, yeah. yeah right. Like there's sort of a sense well, of he comfort. Put, he put a lot of work into it. There's a, but but it, yeah, exactly. Right. A lot of engineering goes into that. Yeah, I recognize you. So feel I want to, just to close, mm -hmm. you have uh, the rise of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who don't use focus groups. Correct. Um, and the much more effective form of monitoring habits, desires, proclivities uh, offered by uh, the digital surveillance that we're all under. Where are we going? What, what's mm -hmm. happened? Uh, and why did we see insurgencies by two political candidates? And of course, Hillary Clinton was up to here with she wouldn't utter a word like her mm -hmm. husband unless it had passed through folks. Mm -hmm. what, what's what are we watching? So um, yeah, that's absolutely right. The, Hil the Hillary Clinton campaign. She she's been focus grouped all her life, just like her husband. There's nothing there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. She's as um, as one Reddit comment commenter. There's always like a, you know, insight in the weirdest places. But one Reddit commenter described her as a shiny robot built not to offend, <laughs> which is like very true. Um, and. Um, and you know she was. Um, uh, although let's not forget, she she did win the popular vote by quite a lot. Um, there was still there was a lot of um, dissatisfaction with her, which is why the election went the way it did. And um, and you you see on the one hand, and a, and I think that some of the popularity of both Trump and um, Sanders had to do with um, a fatigue with yeah. this culture of consultation, this focus grouped world. So on the one hand, you have, um, you have Trump, who sort of exemplifies um, that um, longstanding um, reactionary distaste for focus groups. I mean, he's, he's, he's the elite guy who doesn't want to listen to anyone. So when asked whether he um, uses focus groups, he says, he says no, I, I listen to focus groups right here. You know, so like that's just sort of classic. Like, why should I listen to any people? 
On the other hand... Well, you know, just to throw in Matt Taibbi, I think correctly points out he's totally in tune with America because he spends all day in front of television. That's just like the rest of America. So he's like, exactly. he doesn't need a focus he, he knows exactly <laughs> what we're watching, Fox News. You know, so that's, so he's, he's literally, the, the president is like that guy in the airport bar you sit next to yeah, so you know, who gets all his information from right, Fox News. So, me, I've just got a minute. So just close by telling us where we're headed. Mm. So, I mean, right now we're... Um, um, we're actually really in a 24-hour focus group with, um, um, with um, we give our opinion freely on the internet all day long. Um, the, um, the, the, the elites of um, both the corporate and political class have more access than ever to knowing exactly well, what we every, think. they have everything. Yeah, to know. Medical it, that's or right. anything they want. That's they right. Got. That's right. Um, and... Um, and, and there's, I think, um, one one of the things we have to remember is that there's a certain pleasure to that. We enjoy being heard. We enjoy giving our opinion. But we also need to remember that um, th that these um, um, that um, those ways of being heard, the, uh, when we give voice in in that way, um, we're um, we're not um, getting any closer. To, um, to, to building popular power. And I think there's a growing recognition of that, that people are getting um, fatigued um, with simply giving voice and are, are, are seeking way, um, alternatives for, to well, more participation. We'll end it there, but okay. get off of Facebook. Yeah, um, Facebook. They're not your friend, That's along right. with Google and everyone else. Thank That's you. Right. That was Liza Featherstone, author of Divining Desire.